got your Bibles, uh, primarily I'm going to be in Exodus 2, and uh, I'm going to also read a passage out of Hebrews chapter uh, number 11. So Hebrew, or excuse me, Exodus chapter 2, uh, back there in the Old Testament is where I'm primarily the message, message is going to be at this morning. I'm going to go ahead and read uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 11. In uh, the verse 23, for sake of time, to get us kind of rolling here. Uh, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child. And they were not afraid of the king's commandment. And then Exodus 2, I'm going to read the first ten verses there out of Exodus 2. Exodus chapter 2. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And a woman conceived and bare a son, and she saw him that he was a goodly child. She hid him three months. When she could not uh, longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and dabbed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. She laid it uh, by the flags, or laid it in the flags by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to uh, wit what would happen, or what would be done to him, excuse me. Uh, And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the riverside. When she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. She had compassion on him, and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And uh, the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, "Uh, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it, and the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And his name was called, or, and she called, excuse me, his name Moses, and she said, because I drew him out of the water. So the title of the message today is The Mothers of Moses. The Mothers of Moses. And we see a, a very unique situation here where we see someone who is in a situation similar to today. He had a, a traditional mother and he had a non-traditional mother. Uh, He had a mother that brought him into this world, and then uh, Moses turned around and was placed into a a situation where he had someone that that was a mother, but was not his biological mother. And this is one of the uh, uh, first instances in Scripture where we see a mother in a very non-traditional role here. And uh, on Mother's Day, I I thought this would be a a good passage to look to where, where we see a diversity uh, I, I can I see here of, of diversity of motherhood that I think if we focus on uh, it can encourage us and, and we can learn some some good principles to take home with us today. Let's uh, pray one more time. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for uh, bringing us together, and we know it's important to gather, and uh, we uh, uh, we need uh, this gathering as part of our personal growth and and part of uh, our obedience to you, not just uh, showing up being obedient, but uh, uh, yielding ourselves to you through uh, what we sing and and what we preach about and what we talk about uh, here within the confines of our church. Help us to uh, see what we need to see today from your word. We know it's your word that changes lives. It's not the the clever or crafty words of man, uh, for that is only mere manipulation, and we want to see changed lives today. And uh, may... uh, Everything that's said and done in the remainder of our time, honor and glorify you. Help me at this time. Cause me to say what you want said. Keep me from saying anything you want said. And uh, Lord, I pray for the one maybe that's struggling with salvation today, that you would speak to that heart, encourage them to uh, do business with you while there's still time to do so. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The mother of today's society faces some unique challenges 
uh, in this world, do they not? I saw a cartoon recently that illustrated what these challenges look like. The cartoon illustrated a a psychologist talking to a patient. The patient's laying down on the on the uh, couch there, and the psychologist is sitting there at his chair, and I'm not necessarily promoting everything psychology offers, but uh, just follow me with the cartoon, just track with me for uh, just a minute. Uh, he looks at her and he says, let's see, you spend 50% of your energy on your job, 50% on your husband, and 50% on your children. I think I see your problem. Moses had two mothers that faced some unique challenges of that day, of that time. This was not a peaceful time. This wasn't uh, a time like you might see in a, in a coloring book of Moses just sitting there happy uh, in a little basket and the mom just, you know, just sitting there with a blank face. And uh, uh, this was a very disturbing time. This was a time where uh, when you read back, and we'll look at some of the verses that talk about it, but uh, this was an unsettling time. The, the Pharaoh, the, the, uh, the, the father of, of the very woman who, who said, Moses is now going to be my son, and I'm going to be a non-traditional mother. Her own father was wanting to massacre these people because he was afraid they would outnumber them and take them over. And so, and we don't know the condition of of uh, Pharaoh's daughter here that was Moses' non-traditional mom. Maybe she couldn't have kids. We we don't know. We don't know what was got, what had gone on there. So so there, there was a, a very unsettling situation wherever you're wherever you're at in this situation. But there's some things here that both of these women had that, that I think we need to focus on and we need to learn from today. The first point for study is their love. We see the first thing about the mothers of Moses is their love. In the first four verses, we, we see that where it says, There went a man of the, the house of Levi and took a daughter of Levi, and the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. So we see the love there where uh, there was unsettling time, and she, she did what she could to hide him. She kept him quiet. And uh, Moses had a couple other siblings at this time. He had uh, Aaron and Miriam, and, and they had to uh, uh, not talk about their new baby brother. They had to keep, keep things on the, on the DL, right? Down low, right? They, they couldn't say a whole lot. And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and dabbed it with slime and with pitch. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. And she puts him in the river. And in verse 4, uh, Moses' sister stood afar off to see what was going to happen to him. So many have said that, that love is the greatest motivator here. Love is the greatest motivator. And uh, uh, the love, here's, here's the context here of, of how uh, um, Jochebed, who is uh, uh, Moses' mother, the context here, if you go back to Hebrew, or excuse me, Exodus, I don't know why I said Hebrew, I think it's part of what we're going to read here in a second, but if you go back to the chapter before that, in Exodus chapter 1, it sets the context and the environment in which this is all going on here, where it says, and uh, this is Pharaoh speaking here, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew woman, and see them uh, uh, sit upon the stools, and that's the... Uh, without describing too much, that is uh, the, what they sat them on as, as the birthing process was starting. So he's saying when you're starting the birthing process and, and that's getting going and you notice that it's a son, then you kill him, he says. But if it be a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. So we see a, a love even here among the midwives that they had a love for God and their love for God overflowed onto these babies. Um, but the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh there, commanded them, but saved the man children alive. This had to get this guy fired up because he gave them a command. We're not, we're not talking about a suggestion. We're not talking about uh, somebody that just kind of stood up that doesn't really mean anything. We didn't, we're not talking about somebody on Facebook that throws a post out there and we just kind of laugh at it and scroll on or make our comment and move on. This is the king of Egypt. What can a king do? He can have you put to death. He can make your life miserable in a heartbeat, right? Uh, and if you skip down to verse 22 of Exodus 1, here's what he did because he was so aggravated. And Pharaoh charged all his people... Everybody he had command of, 
saying every son that is born, and we have to remember, he's not talking about the, the, uh, the Egyptian children, he's talking about the Hebrew children. He says, every son that is born, he shall cast into the river, and every daughter he shall save alive. So this is, this is where we're at now. You have a son, you throw him in the river. Get rid of him. This is, this is the, the context here in which the love for Moses is shown. And in verses 1 through 3 that I read, we see that with the love that Jochebed, the, the mother of Moses, showed, that she begged God for preservation here. Uh, and, and when you look at uh, where the, this word ark that's here, we see where, where is the first time you know an ark was mentioned? Well, that's back in uh, Genesis chapter 6. Uh, verses 18 and 19, but, I, but with thee I will establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark. This is God talking to Moses here. Thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee, and of every living thing, of all flesh, two of every sort, and uh, thou shalt bring them into the ark and keep them with thee. They shall be male and female. So for three months, as long as she could, she hid the infant, managed to keep uh, Miriam and, and uh, Aaron quiet about this, but finally, Jochebed had acted on an idea that's been growing in her mind. Pharaoh had commanded her to put, throw him in the river, so she said, okay, we'll put him in the river, but she made this ark a way to preserve him, to put him in there. So she builds this ark, puts it together, and we see in verse 4, she trusts in a, in, in a promise here, and how do we know she trusted in a promise? Because she was scared. It doesn't say here that she trusted in a promise, but she, she was wise enough to know about it. It says an ark, so she, she built a little ark for him. So she was aware of what God had done previously, because back in those days, there, there, wasn't a, there wasn't a Bible for them to pick up and read. They couldn't read a Bible and say, I want to see what God says about something. Everything that they knew had been orally passed on through conversation, through telling stories. So she was well aware of everything that had taken place in Genesis, okay? In Genesis chapter 22, 10 through 13 gives us a promise here. Something that, that I believe Jochebed knew about and trusted in. Because here it says, Abraham stretched forth his son and took the knife to slay his son. That's, that's Isaac. God had told him to offer, him, offer up an offering and take his son Isaac. And uh, the angel of the Lord called out uh, uh, unto him out of heaven, saying, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham said, Here am I. And he says, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thickets by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. So we, we know that she was, must have been familiar with that. And she believed that, hey, God had, had promised to make Abraham a father of many nations. And yet, at the same time, he wanted him to give up his son uh, uh, to God. So in, so in her mind, she knew that since God had, has honored that promise and prospered that nation, even though there was just you know, three people there, uh, 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 Abraham and his wife Sarah and Isaac, and then the, you fast forward to Exodus, there's millions now. So she knew that God wanted to preserve His people and would do it, and she trusted, hey God, I'm, I'm putting Him in the river. Because I can't hide him anymore. I'm trusting you. I'm trusting that you're going to do what you said you would do. That you would, you would bless your people. And that's something that we need to learn from. Uh, many of us, I think, uh, uh, have had mothers that have prayed over us. And, and trusted in that promise of God hearing our prayers. And, and uh, we need to be so thankful and appreciative of that today. The love shown by... Pharaoh's daughter is talked about in verses 5 and 6 that the daughter of Pharaoh went down in verse 5 and she sees him and she uh, pulls him out, opens it up in verse 6 and she sees, says, Behold, the babe wept and she had compassion on him. So how, how is she showing love here? There's a lot of ways she's showing love, but she pulled him from crocodile infested waters. She pulled, him, and she pulled him from the Nile River, basically. 
And as anyone, I don't know if you've ever been to the Nile River, or maybe you've seen something on National Geographic TV, or maybe even in a magazine, uh, that is not one of the safest places to probably be at. There's crocodiles there. Uh, what little research I did, uh, hippos are there, and while you know there's that cute little song, uh, wanting a hippopotamus for Christmas, I, I've heard hippos are, are kind of an aggressive creature. Uh, you can't go up and pet a baby hippo at a zoo. It'll probably bite your hand off. Or get up, get upset at you, but uh, there's snakes in there. Uh, when I go fishing, for one of the first things I do is look for snakes, and those little critters are sneaky. Uh, when I used to work out at Fellows Lake, I remember one time uh, just tying up my boat to the marina there and getting out from patrolling, and I see a snake just swimming through the water. And the first time I, I I'd never seen anything like that, and I'd, I'd been out fishing at lakes before when I was a kid. But I couldn't remember seeing anything like that. And this snake was probably about that long. I might be exaggerating a little bit, but when you don't like snakes, a, a, a baby gardener snake is that long, okay? Uh, I saw this guy swimming through the water and thinking, man, you know, what, what is, there's things in lakes and in rivers that we don't even see. Um, the mosquitoes. And that's just to name a few. So when Moses gets put in this little ark of bulrushes by Jochebed and gets picked up, by uh, Pharaoh's daughter. This isn't like putting a little baby in a basket at the James River and watching it float down the James River. We're we're talking about a a pretty dangerous situation here. But in this dangerous situation, we see love shown by Jochebed, that she loved him enough to uh, 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 keep him quiet for three months. And and she loved the promise of God enough to, to, to not give in to... Uh, the demands that Pharaoh had, the king of Egypt, as, as he's called here, of wanting uh, Moses just thrown in head first into the water. And we see the love shown by a woman. We don't, we don't know this, this woman's spiritual condition. But yet she had compassion, which, is, which in itself, itself by itself is a godly attribute. And that's something we can learn from and we can appreciate. We don't just see a, a mother's love here. Which is very, very important, which is, which is the starting place for the last two points of the message. Well, we see secondly, for our second point of study today, their guidance. We see their guidance. Look at verse 7. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call thee a nurse to the, of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter, uh, or Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went. And called the child's mother. You know, the first five years of a child's life are fundamentally important. They are the foundation that shapes the child's future, their health, and their happiness, their growth, their development, their learning achievements at school, in the family, and in community, and in the life, in their life in general. Uh, that's not my own thoughts. That's something that that I found from a. a Somebody that, I won't say they're an expert, but they specialize in early childhood development. That those first five years are so formidable for a child and so important uh, that they learn certain skills and that they they get some uh, learning skills developed there. But uh, with the guidance here of of a mother, the guidance of uh, of, uh, Pharaoh's daughter, the decision she made right off the bat here is the first thing to touch on. She chose to put Moses into the care of his own mother and family. Maybe she had an idea who he really belonged to. Maybe she didn't. But she made a decision here that gave Moses guidance. And she had no idea that she was making such a decision. But she was making a decision to send to put uh, uh, Moses in a position where he was going to learn about God at an early age and he was going to learn certain things at at those formative years of his life. We see a a direction from Jochebed, Moses' mother. She taught him to despise injustice. If you look across the page, or excuse me, look down just a few verses in verse 12, um, talking about Moses here, he looked... This way and that way, and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Now, his, the way he went about this, he shouldn't have murdered the Egyptian. He was guilty of murder. But he saw the injustice that was going on, 
And in verse 11, it tells us when it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out to his brother and he looked on their burdens and he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his own brethren. So that's why he committed that murder. He saw what was going on. And I believe that uh, Jochebed, his biological mother, taught him to hate what was going on. Taught him to hate bullying, in other words, to, to hate the enslavement there. Uh, she taught him the, the folly of his anger. In verse 13, in that same uh, chapter 2 here, And he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews stove together, and he said to them, uh, uh, Wherefore smittest thou thy fellow? She taught him to despise uh, the folly of anger. And in verse 17, she taught him to defend the weak. And the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. So there was a situation here. And back in verse 16, now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled their troughs uh, for their father's flock. And that's why he did what he did. Because he saw the weak and he chose to defend them. So we see that there's, a, there's guidance that's important here. The very decisions of Pharaoh's daughter impacted Moses, and she had no idea. The, the, the few years that uh, Jacob had spent with Moses nursing him, getting him to the place where she then turned him over to Pharaoh, she gave him some foundational principles here. We see finally their care. Finally we see their care. Look at verses 9 and 10 with me. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away, nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it, and the child grew, and she brought him into, unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son, and he called, she called his name Moses, and she said, Because I drew him out of the water. Giving care to someone is, a, is an enormous task. There can be an endless list of things to do, and there's an endless list of things that come up when you are a caregiver, when you're giving care. Whether you're giving care as a parent, there's, you, your child gets sick you, and, and, and you have to take them to the doctor. You might have to call off of work. You, you have to take care of those things. And, and uh, when you're at a stage in life where you're taking care of a family member that's gotten older, you have to make decisions and, and, and you have to take care of things that sometimes come up that they're not planned. And then there's just that to-do list. Those things that are every day that, that, are, that take work and they take time. There's a lot that goes into care. Jochebed made sure that Moses was healthy. In 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 7, Paul writes for us, that We were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. Now Paul writes this talking about spiritual nourishment. Jochebed made sure Moses was healthy. And Paul uses this analogy of a nurse, someone taking care of a child, nourisheth her children. She gave him care. Today we need to make sure we're giving care, both spiritually and physically, this morning. Jochebed demonstrated stewardship. She understood the principle that hadn't even been written down yet that comes out of Psalm uh, chapter 127 and verse 3, it says, Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is His reward. In other words, Jochebed understood, really? Moses belonged to God and didn't belong to her. And she treated him as such. Similar to how Hannah, when she had Samuel, she, she uh, raised him up to probably, this, I believe, a similar age that Moses was at when Moses was then turned over to Pharaoh's daughter. And... Uh, uh, gave a foundation and, and demonstrated stewardship there. And then we see that Pharaoh's daughter, how she comes into the mix with her care, she equipped Moses. She, and how did she equip, equip Moses here? If you look in Acts chapter 7 and verse 22, we see a short account there where it tells us, Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. Moses didn't get that by being raised by wolves, friends. He didn't get that by just uh, being sat outside and, you know, you go do your own thing, just uh, leave me alone and let me listen to somebody play a harp for me or, or while I read my scroll. Somebody invested in him, and I believe it started with, with Pharaoh's own daughter. And what she didn't know, she probably came up with the resources for him to get the knowledge he needed so he could be mighty, 
in words and in deeds. Well, I, I'm so glad that it tells us there that He's mighty in words and in deeds. Because it's easy to be mighty in words now than it's ever been before. And I don't mean just speaking suave. Okay, I've stumbled over myself plenty of times today. But you all probably know somebody that can stand up and they're, they're pretty, they're smooth, what I call a smooth operator. They don't stutter. They, they, they make things sound really good. They can make you feel really good about holding a bag that uh, is full of uh, something that's worthless. Let's just put it that way. Okay? There, there's people that are that smooth with their words. But Moses was not somebody that was just smooth with words. Although I find it funny, he's described as somebody that's smooth with words. And, and, and mighty in words, and yet later he tells God that he's a stutterer. But we're told in, in Acts 7.22 that he was mighty in deeds. He's mighty in deeds. Remember what I read in, uh, back in verse 17 of Exodus 2, where Moses stood up and he helped these, these people that were getting water. He stood up and he helped them and he watered their flock. He didn't just say to these people, Eh, leave them, leave them alone. Let them, let them get the water for their flock. He saw a need. He got up. He got involved. And he did what he could to help institute some positive change. So the mothers of Moses, these are mothers that showed love. They gave guidance. And they had given him care. Friends, those are things we all need. Regardless of where we're at. Hello. I thought maybe the rapture was happening or something. I'm like, do we need to sing a hymn, Lord? What, what, what hymn's playing? So where was I? Oh, their love, their guidance, and their care. And friends, we need that. And regardless how, how tough we may think we are, and how we can just rambo our way through life, I want to do that, to be honest. Oh, I want to take the Rambo attitude. But friends, we, 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 have to, we have to be humble enough to admit we need love. We need a little bit of love once in a while, don't we? We need, we need guidance. We need somebody to tell us, hey, you know what? You need to change your ways. You need to get your house in order. And we also need somebody that gives us care. Somebody that maybe, uh, maybe when we're having a rough day, maybe they provide us with a meal. Uh, uh, maybe they go take us fishing. That's providing some care in some way, is it not? In closing, you want to make a difference for uh, for somebody that you think, whether it's maybe it's a mom you have in your life that's somebody that brought you into this world, or somebody that's a motherly figure. A way you can make a difference is to write down thirty-one ways or thirty-one things. Excuse me that this person is done for you or does for you. Make a point of thanking them specifically for one each day for the next coming month. On each day of the following month, pay her a new compliment on one of her good attitudes, character qualities, habits, and talents. And be prepared for a better relationship than you've enjoyed in quite a while. Some, most, a lot of that applies to marriage, but you can use that on a mom. I found that this week and thought it was perfect to illustrate. How do you close out a message where you talk about somebody showing love? Somebody not just you know, talking about it, somebody that's actually doing something. Uh, what, what, can you, what do you do with, when you hear a message like that? Now, how do, we, how do we tie this back to Christ? Do the same with Jesus Christ today and see what happens. Trust Him for salvation if you never have. Follow Him in believer's baptism. Now that doesn't save you, but it's just like this ring that I wear. I just now took it off. Does that mean I'm single? No, it doesn't. I'm still married now. Charity would probably wonder, why are you not wearing that? But, uh, but the fact I took it off, I'm still married. And uh, baptism's a similar idea as a wedding ring. It's a symbol. Uh, I knew a lady I used to work with uh, when I was working at uh, a Kmart distribution center in Kansas, sending trucks out. And the truck drivers were trying to ask her on dates, and she wanted them to leave her alone. Well, she started wearing a, not a full wedding ring, but she would wear a ring. And just like that, they left her alone. Because they thought she was in some relationship, and she wasn't. 
But I asked her, I said, I noticed you're wearing a ring. She said, yeah, it's just to keep the truckers from uh, bothering me. That was all it was for. And then finally, something else to think about what to do with a, a message like this, with, with love, guidance, care. Consider joining this body or this family of believers because membership matters. And that's something that in my two years here, I, I have failed to probably state as often as I ought to. But because uh, sometimes I think God will just take care of things, and, and He will. But it's also my responsibility to bring things up, and, 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 and at least how do we apply messages? And membership is part of it, pledging ourselves to be part of a, a local body. You know, when the Apostle Paul wrote his letters in the New Testament, he named people. He didn't name people that just to be generic, he didn't name people whose names sounded good. He named people who were counted to be part of those places that he wrote to. He wrote to those people that were in their meeting groups. Just like in a family, you just don't make up names. Those names are, are they're people that have importance, they have significance. They're people you show love to. They're people you show guidance to. They're people you show care to. So the mothers of Moses, just to recap, we see that they've shown him love. They gave him guidance. And they gave him care. Friends, we're we're in need of all those today. We've got to depend on God to bring those about. And those are things that you can hopefully appreciate about a mother. And if you're here as a mother and you're wondering, what can I do for my kids? Do what Jochebed and and Pharaoh's daughter did. Show that love. Uh, Give that guidance. And then give that care. Let's pray.